This is the seventh video on using MATLAB. This video is going to look at inputs which have a more general format rather than steps and ramps. Earlier videos showed how you could use MATLAB to determine step responses, either as a numerical output or as a figure. However, in many cases, the input to a system may be somewhat more arbitrary or in particular, a time varying signal. And we might want to know how to use MATLAB to represent this. So if I uh, do a sketch, let's imagine that was U of T here. And now I'm going to do a sketch of what U of T looks like. What if it was to be something like this? How would you actually find the response of the system G to an input like that? And who knows what it's going to do? something like that. But the key thing is that the input U of T is not a step, it's not an impulse, it's something else. And we need a way of finding the system behaviour when the input is time varying. The first thing we need to do now is ask ourselves, how do we define a time varying input? Now MATLAB is going to use a function called LSIM, which we'll get to in a minute, to deal with this. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we supply information to LSIM about the time varying input. So this is the rules. First, the input signal is defined as a vector along with the corresponding times. MATLAB will only calculate the output of the process at the times at which you have defined the input. These times must be equispaced. That's quite a hard and fast rule, so you need to be careful there. And what does MATLAB do? It interpolates the input during the time spaces. So if, for example, if I do a little sketch here, if that was time t1 and that was time t2, and I said the input was here at t1 and it was here at t2, MATLAB is going to do some form of interpolation between the two to say what the input is is doing in between. Now if you want to know what interpolation MATLAB is using I suggest you look at the built-in help. But the key thing that I'm going to recommend to you is if you keep the distance between T1 and T2 small then you ensure that any associated approximation errors are also small and they're not too important. But of course that also tells you something, that when you're using time varying inputs, there is some approximation embedded, which you will get less of when you're doing step responses. How do we define the input then? I'm going to do this using an example, after which I hope what you need to do is obvious. So let's assume that you want an input which is a sinusoid, that's quite a common input, whose frequency is 2 radians per second, and we're going to define the sinusoid over a time of four seconds. We also need to know the system time constant because that tells us how fast the system behaves. So let the uh, dominant time constant be something like 0.5 seconds and perhaps that needs to capture the uh, fast transients from the process as well. Now in order to minimize numerical errors, the sample time for the input is going to have to be less than about 0.5 and you'll notice that's the time constant if I write that that's the time constant divided by 10 now indeed you could divide by a number greater than 10 so I'm that's why I'm saying the sample time must be less than 0.05 so sample at least 10 times as fast as the principal time constant of the process also we need to know about the input signal how fast is the input signal changing? Well, we said the input signal was, was uh, a frequency of 2 radians per second. So really, again, we need to sample at least 10 times as fast, which is 20 radians per second. Now, I've used a formula, which you may not be familiar with, which is omega t equals 2 pi. So the frequency times the period of a sinusoid equals 2 pi. And I've used that to give an idea about what sort of sample time I might need, or indeed what would be the period of the, um, the signal that I'm sampling with, and we end up with something around 0.3 seconds. So if you look at those two numbers, the 0.3 and the 0.05, what I'm going to say is, okay, we need to use 
the 0.05 as an upper bound on the spacing in our input signal. Now, just as a reminder, this is an illustration. You have to go through this analysis with whatever input signal and system you are dealing with to make sure that your spacing is small enough. Don't make it too small, otherwise you'll have a ridiculously large number of computations, which is equally bad. So, I've got an end time of 4 seconds. I've got a spacing of 0 0.05, so I've defined my vector of times here. Naught colon 0 0.05 colon 4. So that will give me a vector of time starting from naught, going to 4 in spaces 0 0.05. Next, I've defined my sine wave. Now it is u equals sine of 2 times tt. You'll notice the frequency was 2 radians per second, which is where that's 2 come from. And then I can plot this to see what it looks like. Now before we do the plot, a key question. What would happen if we were to sample too slow? So if our spacing was bigger than 0 0.05? Let's have a look. You can see here, let's uh, move some of these... Um, lines which may be obscuring our plot. We can see a bit better. All right, that's better. Now, you'll see the red line shows you the plot we get with our spacing of 0 0.05. And the red line looks fairly clean. Clearly, it isn't perfectly clean, but it looks fairly clean. And I think what you would argue is if you use that red line instead of the exact sinusoid, you're pretty confident you'll get the behavior that you expect from the process and the approximation errors will be small. However, what about this blue line? This blue line has used a spacing of 0 0.5 seconds. And what do you notice? With a spacing of 0 0.5 seconds, the blue line is nothing like the sinusoid. And therefore, if you feed this blue line into LSIM, you'll be getting the response not to a sinusoid, but to a different curve altogether. And what that illustrates is the spacing has got to be small enough so that your approximation is as close to the sinusoid as you need it to be. What's the syntax for LSIM then? Students are reminded that this is just an illustration. If you want the full range of alternatives, use the MATLAB help and guidance. But all I'm going to do is demonstrate this particular syntax, this one here. So y, t equals LSIM g, u, t. So first of all, why? That will be the system output at times t. t, which I've put in this output vector, those are the times at which the output has been computed. And you'll notice that's the same syntax as used with step. g, that represents my system transfer function. u, that's the input values corresponding to the vector t. And obviously, t here in the input is the time at which the input values are supplied. Now, you will notice I've got the same t in the input and the output. I could use different names, but they would come out to be the same anyway. So I've made them the same here just to demonstrate that point. Let's look at MATLAB then and see this in action. OK, so first, here's the lines I've shown you. So if I do those top two lines first, you can see I've defined a vector with a spacing of 0 0.05 and a vector with a spacing of 0 0.5. If I now do my plot of sine, oh sorry, calculate my u, and uh, do the plot of these two curves, that's the curve we had before. And you can see what happens if I don't get the spacing right, the system doesn't quite work. Now what I could do here is I could say, all right, let's try a spacing of 0.25. For TT, is that any better? And you can see I'm beginning to get quite close to the red curve, but clearly the blue has still got some very obvious corners and very obvious approximation errors. And how small do you need to make this time spacing to be before the curve is reasonably good? And that's where we get the 0 0.05 from. All right, let's go on to LSIM then. So we want to use LSIM. First, I define my transfer function. There we go, g equals tf. 10, 156, it's an arbitrary transfer function. Now I can use LSIM without any output arguments, just like I can use step without any output arguments. And what do you get? You see, you get this figure, which has got a very obvious blue curve, which is the system output. But you'll notice it's put this faint curve in the background, and that corresponds to the input signal, which you've used.
However, if I want to control the plot, then far better. Use the full um, argument. There it is, yt equals else m g u t t, and then control the plot myself. Say exactly what I want to happen, and you'll see here. I've used a plot statement which says put the output in red and put the input in blue, so I know which is which. So some conclusions. We've demonstrated that MATLAB will simulate systems with time-varying inputs. We've showed one variant of the syntax for using lsim.m, and you can read the MATLAB help if you want to look at other variants. Students need to be aware that there is approximation involved because you are approximating the input signal by the sample rate that you use.